If you open your Bibles to the New Testament, and we're going to look at the book of Ephesians. So join with me there, and as you turn, if you'd like to do so, would you stand with me as we read in Ephesians, the sixth chapter? And so I'd appreciate that. We stand and we give God our attention at this time. We find this scripture in verse 5, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, if you will follow with me. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Father, thanks be to your word. Forgive me where I fail you. Dear God, I'm asking now for wisdom, not so that I could impress anyone about me, but I pray that I might impress everyone about you. In Jesus' name, be with this service, everyone who hears May it come from your heart, words of truth, power, and love, in the name of Jesus, to God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. This text is like an onion, and you've often heard people describe sometimes truth like an onion. You start peeling back different layers. And so today and probably next week, we're going to look at this text and we're going to take time and peel away different layers. The scripture here is much like what you will find. And because of that, I will reference Colossians, which if you find in your Bibles, Ephesians, and then you look at Philippians, and then you come to the book called Colossians. But we're going to look at some text found here that talks about, first of all, serving God wholeheartedly. Now, I want us to think about this for a moment. It's talking about employment, first of all. Let's look at on the first layer of the onion. At the very surface of this scripture, it is talking to those who are bond servants, which is a form of employment. Very common in that time, a person had a master, if you will, or a supervisor, and they worked. Now, it's different than the term we often think of as slavery. This is actually an agreement that you had with an employer, a master, and you had a time that you were going to work for that person, perhaps paying back a loan, doing some type of service. An agreement was made, a contract was made, agreed upon. And this was a form of employment. And here we find in this text, it says that you should be obedient to your master. Now. I want to step back and look at this text very carefully. As Christians, it makes us think about the importance that you have a contract, you have a commitment that you've made to Christ. No matter where you work in life, no matter what your place of employment, no one should have to try to manage your time. No one should have to be on your back telling you what to do because as a Christian, you have a greater obligation and that is you have made a contract with God and that contract says this, I'm going to please God in all that I do. Therefore, if I take a job, I'm going to do my very best because I'm not concerned about an overseer or about what someone else's opinion might be, but you have a contract with God first. And that contract says that you're going to please God with your life. You're going to bring God praise because the way you conduct yourself at your job. You know, Christians, they ought to be some of the most hardest working, honest people you ever find. A few years ago, I've mentioned this fellow's name where I have also in this world, I have a job 
and it's at a plastic conversion company. And I was taking a supplier of one of our chemicals, I was taking them through our factory, and I came to a certain department where a man who 74 years young is working, and I'll say this about him first, he was recognized as one of the hardest working persons, man or woman, in the whole factory of 600 people. No matter what your age, they knew his name was Jimmy. If you work with Jimmy, you better get ready to sweat. He didn't need an overseer. He wasn't afraid of a boss. And he wasn't trying to win or impress others. You see, Jimmy, he told me when I first met him, I hadn't been working at the company long. He said, you wouldn't believe what my life used to be. I wrecked my life. He said I was an alcoholic. I was in the bars. I hurt and destroyed my home. I was not at all the husband or the father I needed to be. I was wrecking my life and wrecking my family. He said, but God found me and he changed my life. I remember him telling me with tears, he said, God did something in my life that I couldn't do and no one else could do for me. But I put my hope in Jesus and God, he kept his promise because Jesus makes a promise. If you'll come to me, I'll change your life. That's God's promise. And only God can do that because God can operate on your heart. No one else can do that. Not even yourself. You can't change your heart. Only God can. And how does he do that? By believing in Jesus Christ. That he's the living son of God. And he died according to the scriptures. For the sins of your life. And for the sins of the whole world. Because he loves you. He died on the cross for your sins. And by the power of God. He was raised again. And he lives today. And if you put your hope and trust in him. Invite him to come into your life. God will change you. And he'll change you from the inside out. Only God can do that. Only God can. Jimmy told me about his conversion to Jesus Christ. And then I got to see that faith in action. Because if you truly have faith in Jesus, there'll be action that follows. You're not saved by your works, but God saves you to work. Amen? And he was an example of Jesus on the job. He didn't need anybody saying, hey, you need to get your job done. You need to do your job right. You could count on him. That 74 year old young guy, he was doing his job at all times. And he gave an example to everybody. I have faith in God and look at what God's doing in my life. And boy, I'd come through the factory. And one day I had a group of chemists, suppliers of our chemistries that goes into our plastics. I was walking them through the factory and we came to that department where Jimmy was working and they looked and they made note. They said, well, look at that older guy. And I said, don't let that fool you. That white hair on his head. Don't let that fool you. He's the hardest working man you'll ever see. We sat there and watched him and I said, how would you like to meet him? And they said, sure. I said, hey, Jimmy, I got somebody I want you to meet. Jimmy came over, sweat pouring down his face. He had been working in an area called lamination. He came over. I said, Jimmy, these are suppliers of one of our chemistries. They're here from Philadelphia. And I'm just showing them through the factory. And I noticed how hard you're working and how much pride you take in your job. I just wanted to call you out and tell you I appreciate how hard you work. And he turned around without hesitation. He said, my name's Jimmy Schwartzel. And I want to ask you something. Do you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior? He changed my life and he can change yours too. <laughs> I thought to myself, wow, what boldness. What an example of Jesus. If you're going to take a job as a Christian, then do it wholeheartedly. That's at the surface of the scripture, right? That's what it says. Verse five says, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. Many years ago, when I was 18, my dad, and I've often spoke of him, no one's perfect. My father, 
and certainly not me. No one's perfect, but my dad did give me an example of what it means to be a hard, honest worker. And I value that. As I've gotten older, I place great value on the example my dad left for me. He tried to stress that to me as a young boy, a boy who loved to play. And I'm not saying that with pride. I oftentimes would leave dad doing his job by himself, and I'm ashamed of that because I could have learned so much more from him. But I ran off on my bike and my friends and I, we got together and played basketball, baseball, and just played. Nothing wrong with having a little fun, but nothing should ever take the place of learning to be a good worker and an honest worker. Nothing. I've learned that in life. When I was 18, I took a job on 2nd Street in Hamilton, Ohio. It was called Fin Pan. I had no idea what I was getting into. I went to a temporary service. I was out of high school, and I needed a job. And so I went to a temporary service, and they said, your, your job is going to be working at this place called Fin Pan. I thought, well, that's an odd name. I showed up at Fin Pan, and you walked into that place, and here's a place making hot, making flat roof insulation. So it took a foam board, cut it, and it was about 36, 40 inches long, a layer of concrete on top of it that had to be trimmed and molded, and about 7,200 boards a day were stacked, and the steam coming off that cement, the factory remained about 100 to 105 degrees temperature at all times. I remember thinking to myself when I walked in there, I thought, I'm not for sure this is where I wanted to be. Here's this playful kid, and they said, here's your job, young man. You're going to cut with a razor knife. You've got to keep this loader full of these eight-foot-long styrofoam pieces. And the best way to do it is to balance about six to eight of them on your head, hands to your side, and then you learn to throw them into the feeder, but don't let that feeder get jammed because that'll mean operations comes to a halt, and we don't have time for your mistakes. First thing I did, I got all these pieces thrown in there and they all got jammed and operations came to a halt. And here came the manager. I thought, boy, it looks just like my dad walking at me. And that's not good. But I learned to work and I learned to work hard at that job. And the Lord knows it to be true. And I remember the concrete, I, my fingers were soft because I hadn't been a good worker. And the concrete got on the ends of my fingers. And I remember about after a day of working there, 10 hour days, five to six days a week, I remember blood was literally dripping off my fingertips because the concrete sand just ate right through my fingers. I walked out of there and I was exhausted. I remember walking out to my car. It had chrome handles on it. And a lady was walking down the sidewalk. Now think of this. Here comes this guy out of a factory. My fingers hurt so bad when I tried to open up my car door, the sun had made those chrome handles so hot, it burned my fingertips. And so a lady was walking down the sidewalk, and I said, excuse me, ma'am, I just came out of this factory. Could you please open my car door? I can't do it with my fingers. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I have a lot to learn about life and still do. But you know, I came back to that job day after day, and I'm what I once complained about when I was working there, I realized that God had a purpose for that job. I wasn't ready to live yet because I didn't appreciate what it was to work hard. And day after day, I went in that factory. I didn't quit. I often would contemplate, maybe I should quit this job. I didn't know I signed up for this. I think I was making $3.25 an hour back then. I remember though it came to a point and I was proud of myself. One day I stood back and a man was standing there observing me and I thought, I don't know, they're just watching my job. I better be doing it right. But I had kind of caught on to things and I took pride. I was working hard, keeping that operation moving. And finally a man who was my boss, he walked, came up to me laughing. He said, hey, that person who was standing back here watching you, that was a new hire. I told you we're going to bring somebody in to kind of relieve you and give you some uh, rest from doing this job all day long. He said, they were standing there watching you, and I turned my back, and they weren't there anymore. He said, I looked down 2nd Street, and they're running down 2nd Street. He laughed about it, said, you, you scared them to death how hard you were working. 
I'm not saying that to boast about anything, but you know, as Christians, let's look at this onion one layer at a time. The first lesson here in this text is this. You take a job in life, then do it honestly and do it wholeheartedly as a Christian. You shouldn't have somebody to keep following you around telling you to do your job and to do it right. You have a contract and it's not with some employer. First of all, your contract, your agreement in life is with God Almighty. And that means you've agreed that with God's help, you're going to live life to the best of your abilities. With God's help, you're going to be honest. You're going to be a person of integrity. That means when nobody's watching, you're still going to do your job the same way, which is the right way. And you're going to glorify God at all times. But don't take a job. Sometimes people say, well, you know what? I'm not going to work hard at my job because other people around me, they're laughing. They don't take it seriously. The only time they ever do their job is when the boss is there watching. Keep in mind, as a Christian, you have a boss. And his name is Jesus, the King. And that means you're not serving other people, whether they're being a worldly boss. You're to serve God and you're to take direction even from your worldly boss because you honor God because he's given you that job. Amen. Amen? You say, well, they're not paying me enough. You agree to it. Do the job. Right? And you know what will happen? This is true. When you, by faith, serve God in all ways, which means even at work, if you'll quit worrying about what others are doing or not doing and just serve God wholeheartedly, God's He's going to reward you. That's what the Bible says. Look what it says here in verse 8. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord. You see that in verse 8? God's watching. God knows what you're doing and he knows why you're doing it. That's what's important. You have a job in life and it's bigger than just your job that you get paid 40 hours for. Your job in life is to do everything wholeheartedly to please God. Everything. Whether it be a husband, whether it be a wife, a son or daughter. You should not be worried. So many times I've done this at a job. Why am I breaking my back? No one else is. As a Christian, we are to walk with God. And that means it doesn't matter who is watching. God is watching. And the only person I should be concerned about is what God sees, what God knows. And what good is it to impress other people if you're not pleasing God with your life? Right? That's what it means to fear God. Sometimes people say, I don't understand what that means to fear God. That means to have the utmost respect for God. That means you'll live your life primarily out of respect for God. Regardless what other people are doing or not doing, regardless if the boss is sitting in the room next to you, it doesn't matter. Let us be found doing good at all times because you're following Jesus. And if you're following Jesus, it's a 24-7 job. You're not on the clock with God. You gave your life to Jesus. Therefore, live for Him at all times. Amen? You can't, listen, how can you share the gospel with others if you're not a good worker? My dad, he was an interesting character. And he would say to me, you know, Paul, always keep a nice yard, keep it clean, keep it nice and clean in your house. And I, I, I look at him and sometimes he'd say to me, he goes, because if you ever have to talk to your neighbor about Jesus, they're never going to believe you unless they see you're a good worker. Now you say, well, he kind of made that up, but not really. That's what the Bible's teaching us here, right? If you want other people to believe your testimony, then you have to have a testimony. Amen? You can't be a liar and then go tell somebody, I want to tell you the truth about Jesus. And you can't, listen, you can't live life bitter and then go someone tell someone, hey, I'd love to tell you about the joy of knowing Jesus. And you can't be dishonest 
Someone who steals and, and you say, well, I, I, they're not paying me enough at my job. I got to steal. No, you don't. Live for God. And the Bible says here, if you put your faith in God and do what he asks you to do at all times, he will reward you accordingly. He'll take care of things. Quit trying to take things in your own hands. Do what God asks you to do. And God will reward you for doing that. Amen. Don't be jealous. Don't covet what other people have. You say, but they're making so much more money than me. I deserve that job. Don't fall into that trap. God has given you a job in life. He's given you your two hands, your two feet. Serve God with what He has given you. Serve Him gladly, faithfully, and leave life in God's hands, and God will take care of it. Amen? God's bigger than your boss at work. He's bigger than anybody else that's watching you. God sees, He knows, and God is never, ever going to forget those who love Him. Never. Amen? Serve Him wholeheartedly. That's what the Bible's teaching us, right? Look at Colossians. I said we're going to reference Colossians. Let's go over to that book now. If you have Ephesians open, go over to Colossians and let's look at some scripture found there. Colossians, you'll find many of these words read very similar to what we just read before. The scripture tells us here, look at verse 17. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If I, now listen carefully, if I live my life and I have a job, if I have, listen, as a mom or dad, and sometimes it gets discouraging, you wish you had a better car, a nicer house, you wish you had more money in the bank, but know this, if you'll live by this principle given here, if I live my life for the purpose of pleasing God in everything I do, whether it be in deed or thought, in all things, I'm going to do everything to honor God with my life, and I'm going to give Him thanks for what I have. Yes, it may not be the same things that other people have, but thanks be to God, He has given me what I need. And if I'm going to serve God faithfully, I'm going to give Him thanks every day. I'm going to praise Him no matter what the circumstances may be. And I'm going to walk with God by faith because I know God is going to reward me because God looks at my life and He knows why and He knows what I'm doing. And it doesn't matter what other people may think about me. All that matters is I'm going to please God with my life and I'm going to honor the name of my King and that is Jesus. That's the reason I should be living. I'm not here to try to impress you. I didn't come here to try to preach a message today to get anybody to say job well done. I hope I preached the message today that came from the heart of God so that God may say to me someday, Paul, job well done. If I don't hear those words, then nothing else really matters. You have a job in life. Do it wholeheartedly. Do it wholeheartedly. My dad would say some things I can't repeat sometimes. Certainly not behind the pulpit. But he would say it in a nice way. Paul, learn to kick yourself in the hind end because no one else will. Get up and get your job done. You know, we have, as Christians, let's go to the next layer of the onion. As Christians... We have jobs to do. And the only way to please God is to do it with sincerity. You have a job to do at home. I have a job. I have a job to share Jesus out of love with my kids, with Samantha. Sometimes, honestly, I say this. I wonder why Samantha Landon or PJ or Allie, if it was just because of me, I question why they would ever believe in God because many times I've been a hypocrite. As a father, I have a great job to do. As a mother, 
you have a great job to do. As a son and daughter, you have a great job to do. Let us be busy doing God's business in our lives and do it wholeheartedly. God, when, listen, when I open up Genesis chapter 1, you know what I read? I read the story of creation and I read about God and He does things wholeheartedly. Yes? He took a rock called earth that was dark and covered in water and ice and the Bible says that God said, let there be light and He saw that it was good. It doesn't say that God kind of saw that it was kind of good. No, it says God did it wholeheartedly. That is, he did it right. He designed an earth with all the atmosphere, with all the right conditions. He placed us on an earth that would give life. God did it right. And when Jesus came and he offered himself on the cross and he died for your sins and he died for the sins of the world and he died for the worst person I've ever met, me, and he gave his life on the cross because he loved us, you know what he did? He did it wholeheartedly. When Jesus came to earth, he just didn't come to earth and kind of walk around and say a few good things and, and try to please people. That's not the Jesus we read about. That's not the Jesus I know. Jesus came and he gave all that he had because he came to please God the Father and he came to save a sinner like me. Why? Because he loved his Father and he loves you and he loves me. And when Jesus came to earth, he came and he served wholeheartedly. And when he went to the cross, he left everything on the cross. He died and he died and he gave his all, all. God didn't hold anything back. When God the Father, when he called on a savior, he didn't go to some angel named Michael. We read about the mighty acts of Michael in the Bible. We read about an angel named Gabriel. God didn't go to the angel Gabriel. The Bible tells us there's thousands of angels in heaven. God didn't go to one of those angels and say, Hey, I need a job. Somebody want to go down to earth and help me do it? No. When God came to us through Jesus, He chose His one and only begotten. And He sent His best. God gave to us wholeheartedly because when love demands, you give wholeheartedly. And if you're going to serve the living God, if I'm going to serve God, if this church is going to serve God, let's do it wholeheartedly because of our love for God. Amen? We close here today with that point. And that is Jesus wholeheartedly came and died for you on the cross. He gave it all. He held nothing back. Because God wants you to know Him. God loves you. He cares about your life. He cares deeply about your sorrows. He cares about your troubles. He cares, he cares about your brokenness. He cares about your present and he cares about your future. And God wants you to know him. And he wants you to know him wholeheartedly. You know, there's a reason many Christians like me. Sometimes we're not effective for Jesus. You know why? Because we're not serving God wholeheartedly. It's like a hobby. We're like. I sometimes call us, we're the two-hour Christian. Sunday morning comes, we put on a shirt, sometimes a tie, a jacket. And for the next two hours, I dance a dance to impress you. I hope that's not what I do. But that's how many times as Christians, that's how we live. It's our two hours of performance. And then we go home. We take our Bibles and we put them somewhere, never to be opened again. We put our clothes in the closets and for the rest of the week, we live as though we never encountered God. We're two-hour Christians. 
But that's not what God called us to be. He called us to serve Him wholeheartedly. And that means take the name of Jesus with you. Wherever you go, whatever the circumstances, your life is hidden in Christ and God. And if you love the Lord, then serve Him wholeheartedly. You know, a young boy, probably Johnny. How old are you, Johnny? 14. He's your age. A young boy one day, you've heard the story many times, and it illustrates so many different truths at different levels. A young boy many times, many years ago, back in the book of Samuel in the Old Testament, he came to a valley and he saw his brothers and his Israelites, the country he lived in, they were in great fear and terror. Be, between them and the army of the Philistines was this giant, a man who is greater than nine feet tall, literally a giant. He cursed God and he cursed the army of the Israelites and he challenged them day after day, who will come and challenge me? And not one person would go onto the field. They saw how great he was. They were impressed by his stature and they were afraid. They were cowards. 14 year old boy named Johnny, I mean David. He showed up, made his brothers mad because he came there. He was delivering food to his brothers on behalf of his dad named Jesse. He comes to his brothers and I'm paraphrasing the story, but this is how it unfolds. He says to his brothers, what's going on? And they said, can't you see what's happening here? He said, no, what's happening? He said, look at that man down there. He's challenging us and look how great he is. Look how magnificent he is. Look at the warrior he is. He has challenged anyone who will come down and battle him. And if we would win that battle, then we will win the war. And David said, well, I'll go. His brothers were angry. They said, oh, you little teenage boy, who are you to come in here? Look at us. We're trained soldiers. We have on armor. We've got swords. We've got spears. And here you come walking in. You've got a slingshot on your waist. And here you come in out of nowhere and you say, hey, I'll go out there and fight. Sure, go ahead. And David, he made this remark as he entered the battlefield. He said, all my life. I've learned to serve a living God. And when I look at that man on that field, you guys, you're impressed by me. I'm not so impressed because all my life, I've been looking to the King of Kings and that man, he is nothing compared to the God I serve. Amen. And you know what he did? You know the story. You know what he did, John? He had a slingshot. That's all he had. They said, here, you need to take a, a spear or a sword. He goes, I can't even pick up those things. <laughs> He's a teenage kid. But you know what he did? He served God wholeheartedly. He gave God his very best. And he picked up his slingshot. And he went out there on the battlefield, not embarrassed of his faith in God, not a coward. And he proclaimed Jesus. And he walked out onto the battlefield. And he was there face to face with that giant that had scared everyone. He gave God his very best. And you know what God did? He took care of the rest. The rest of the story is God's. Now listen to me. We close this way. You give God your very best. You say, but Paul, it's not good enough. Listen to the story of David. You just faithfully give God your very best. You do what God has given you to do in life. You do your job, do it rightly, do it honestly, do it faithfully as though you're serving God above. And you know what's going to happen? When you do your very best, God's going to take care of the rest. Those other things are too big for you. They're giants. And you're right, by yourself, you're never going to defeat those giants at home in your family, in your life, 
or at work or whatever you're facing in life, that illness, those things, they will defeat you. Quit looking at the things of this world. Quit listening to what other people are saying to you. And you just keep your heart and your mind focused where it belongs on the living almighty God. And you serve God gladly, giving thanks and say, Lord, I'm going to give you my best. I don't have much to offer, but I'm going to give you my very best. And you know what God's going to do? He's going to reward you. He's going to take care of all those troubles that you can't overcome. God is going to take the battle, and the battle will, will be God's. That's what's going to happen. We are called to serve God wholeheartedly. That's all He asks of us. That's all He asks of us. And there's not one person, including me. We can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. Listen, you and I, we can't get to heaven alone. That's why God sent His Son, Jesus. He came to us because we couldn't get to God. Right? And that's why He died on the cross. Because we can't save ourselves. God has saved us through Jesus Christ. So quit trying to live your life independent of God and start putting your faith and your hope completely in God, serving Him wholeheartedly, and God will take care of the rest. Amen. Right? You say, yeah, but you don't know my troubles. Maybe. But don't forget how great God is. I don't know your troubles, but I do know how great God is. And there's not a person here today, no matter what your circumstances are, God loves you, He cares about you, and God can take care of your problems. Amen? And if you'll take God home to work or your family, and you be the light that God wants you to be in the darkness of your home, your family, wherever it is, you be the light that God has called you to be, then God is going to reward you. And listen, you're going to be a game changer. That's right. Every person here, listen, God can do great things through anybody if you'll just serve Him wholeheartedly. Amen. That day, Jimmy Swartzel, one day, I've shared this with you before. One day, the president of the company, he said to me, you know, Paul, we're having conversation. He said, you know what happened to me today? He was so very serious. He said, I was leaving the parking lot today, walking out, and this elderly man, you know this man named Jimmy? I said, I do. I think I know who you're talking about. He said, I was walking outside and he was there and I thought, you know, which he rightfully should have done. That's what the Bible teaches. We didn't get to it. But as a supervisor, a master, he respected and he expressed at least a word of hello to this man. He said, hello, and said, thanks for working. He didn't know who this man was. And he said, you know what that man did? He turned around to me and he came up and he told me about Jesus. And I thought to myself, what an example of Christ, right? He, he shared Jesus with whoever it was because you know what he was doing? He was serving God wholeheartedly. And that's all God asks of us. When you serve God wholeheartedly, God's going to do great things in your life. We're going to close here today. And the great question is, as we leave here today, can you say in your heart today that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I'm not asking, are you a member of a religious church? I'm not. I'm asking, do you know Jesus personally? Because Jesus came to know you personally. The Bible says it this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God wants you to know him personally. And that's why Jesus came. Do you know him today as your Lord and Savior? You say, what do I need to do? First of all, admit you've sinned against God. The Bible says we've all sinned against God. Secondly, believe that Jesus came from God. That he's the only begotten. He came without sin. He lived a perfect life. 
And he died on the cross for your sins and for mine. And believe that God, according to the word of God, the scriptures, God raised him the third day. And that Jesus lives today. And he offers salvation to all people. Everyone is welcome to come to God. And confess he's Lord. The Bible says it this way. That if you'll believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and confess that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. Have you ever confessed Jesus is the Lord of your life? God is inviting you to come to him. We you open your heart and do that today? We're going to stand. We're going to have a word of prayer. Then the invitation music will be playing. The altar is open. No one is looking around. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed, please, out of respect for the neighbor. I'm going to ask you today in your heart, is there a decision that you need to make today? And say, I'm going to lift my hand and say, would you please pray for me? I promise I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out. I promise I'm not going to do that. A hand's been raised. Anyone else today say, please pray for me. I see your hand. God sees your heart. Anyone else? Another hand, another hand, another hand. Every, listen, there are many hands raised here today. Thank you so much. You can put your hand down. You know, God has seen your hand being raised and God knows your heart and what that expresses to him. The altar's open here today and whatever your need may be, God, he wants, listen, he wants to take your hand and join his hand and change your life, change the situation. Whatever you're facing, God wants to be the one who helps you through it. Just give him your whole heart. That's all he asks. That means trust in him completely. And God will take care of you. He loves you. The altar is open here today. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, why not right now in your heart, would you pray with me? And most importantly, there's no magical prayer. But in your heart, would you pray something like this and mean it wholeheartedly? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you came and died on the cross for my sins and that you were raised from the dead. And I ask you to come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. I want to live for you. Would you come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and change me? If you'll pray that prayer today, God, he'll keep his promise and God will do what he asks you to do. The altar's open here today.